Not so long ago, the British government declassified very interesting documents about unidentified aerospace phenomena, or UAP. This is what the government calls UFOs. In one very strange official intelligence report, it is discussed a possible mental impact on a person, of a kind of radiation, coming from UFOs. It is noted that neurological, rather than biological effects, may be the key to a certain human behavior, after exposure to UAP radiation in the near field. According to the UK Alliance for Disaster Research, such close contacts occur only a few times a year. It is obvious, that people under the influence of these effects do not realize, that their behavior and perception of what they are observing, is changing. It seems, that this effect can occur near the UAP, no matter if a person is on the street or indoors. This causes the brain, to interact in an unusual way with the imagination library, causing information about visual activity, that is not actually a true representation of facts. Basically, they alluded to the fact, that they aren't flying saucers, they aren't tic tacs, but are something, that possess the ability to kind of make your mind see, what makes sense to you. Of the particular interest, is that when reading a limited number of old UAP reports, before the 20th century, although they are often similar, or even identical to modern reports, there is no evidence of the presence of spaceships or aliens, gray or green, no portals or searchlight rays. If you ever read the Bible, have you noticed how primitive technologies of God's messengers are? Just burning swords and flying fire chariots. No starships, blasters, or even automatic weapons. Everything is quite primitive, and clear to the people of that era. What the truly divine technologies of a civilization, that has gone a million years ahead in development. On the one hand, technologies that allow them to ignore the physical laws of our reality, and on the other hand, to interact with a person through a certain interface of a visual library, transforming it with an unknown radiation. Depending on how deep in history it was operated, it may be responsible for events that were the genesis of some main religious movements. The religious part of the UFO phenomenon is often ignored. Some people prefer to see nuts and bolts only, while others, incline to psychological or religious explanation. And very rarely, these effects are seen as parts of one phenomenon. This phenomenon has a long history of mass consciousness delusion. And very often the contact is staged in a religious context. And for example, if this contact is with a man named Saul of Tarsus, who after meeting with a light from the sky, that blinded him on the road, and heard the subsequent voice from this light, completely changed his worldview. Subsequently, he became known as Paul the Apostle, who in fact, developed the entire Christian doctrine. In such cases, the consequences for humanity are fateful. It is the aspect of UFO, that is tightly connected with what is considered to be the spiritual world that causes rejection, both among many scientists and government officials among all other things. I guess in, in, in other cases, um, some individuals have a problem with this topic because it conflicts with their philosophical or maybe theological belief system. I, I, I did experience that as well, because there were people that were, were certainly uh against this this effort uh and and only because of uh, again their, their philosophical belief system i had nothing to do in fact i, I had one I, I remember the conversation very well um this is a person i respected tremendously very very senior person he told me he said lou i want you to stop stop doing this i said okay sir i i, I certainly can but may I ask why and he says well we already know what it is now, at that moment, I, I honestly thought maybe it was our own technology. I was running up against some super uber secret sap and, uh, you know, they were telling me to stop. And I said, OK, sir, so so it's ours. And he said, no, that's not what I'm saying. And he said, uh, he asked me point blank, have you read your Bible lately? And I wasn't quite sure where he was going with that. And I said, well, sir, I, 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 I think I know what it says. What, where are you going with this? And he said, well, then you would know that these things are, are demonic and we should not be pursuing them. But why is it so? Why are UFO events often linked to religion? One answer lies in the fact that the history of religion is a record of perceived contact with supernatural beings. 
many of which descend from the skies as beings of light, or on light. It reveals itself to humans. This kind of event is known in Christianity as Hierophany. A Hierophany is a manifestation of the sacred. It occurs when a non-human intelligent being descends from the sky to the ground, or otherwise reveals itself. The burning bush that Moses witnessed on Mount Sinai, as recorded in the Bible, is a classic example of a Hierophany. Some researchers noticed that in sources of Catholic doctrine of purgatory dated from 1300 to 1880, one can found a lot of unexpected things, such as reports of orbs of light, flames that penetrated walls, luminous beings, forms of conscious light, spinning suns, and disc-like aerial objects. Same caused many researchers to reinterpret their traditions through a biblical UFO framework in which they viewed biblical and historical religious events as UFO contact events. Ezekiel is a, is a good uh, UFO story. So is Saul of Tarsus on the road to Damascus. Yeah. And there is a, a uh, 17th or 16th century painting of the Madonna and St. John, which shows a flying saucer right there. And in the enlargement, the lower right shows the uh, a uh, chap and the dog looking up at uh, a typical UFO. Now, how, why, why did the artist put that into, the, into that painting? It seems ridiculous. Mm -hmm. Well, all through history, strange things in the sky have been reported. But of course, there's so much superstition, so much poor reporting, that one can't do much about it, except to say that strange stories have been reported. Are you saying that throughout our history, Historical references suggest that in the absence of claims of unknown aerial phenomena that amazed and inspired their people, Pharaoh Amenophis IV would not have taken the name Akhenaten and introduced the cult of the sun disk into Egypt. And Emperor Constantine might not have established Christianity in Rome in 312 AD. Ancient chronicles assure us that beings from celestial realms referred to as Magonia, Nirvana, Heaven, or Walhalla, were responsible for telling Mary she would bear the Son of God, for instructing Japanese Emperor Amakuni to honor the Supreme God, for inspiring Muhammad to found Islam in Medina in 612, for helping Henry V of England win a decisive battle over French knights at Agincourt in 1415, and for convincing Charles Quint to abandon the siege of Magburg in 1551. Such interaction with Imagination Library and such effects are something that already makes sense to us as a technology. We even tried to use a similar to it in geopolitic warfare at least once. Or could it be manipulated purposely by people who have the technology to uh, simulate UFO sightings? And mm -hmm. people say, well, of course not. Who would do a thing like that? Well, I would remind you that during, Watergate, during the Watergate investigation, it was discovered that there was a plan uh, originated in the White House to uh, surface a submarine off the coast of Cuba and paint the second coming of Christ over the island of Cuba using holograms. Oh, and, yeah. Which is well within our technology today. The idea was that since there is a large Catholic population in Cuba, uh -huh. they would be so upset by this vision that this would saturate the communication channels, you know, the telephone system in Cuba, long enough for an invasion to take place. Given this influence, the truth may be what we call unidentified flying objects are not necessarily objects, and even not necessarily flying. UFO have been observed since ancient times, and each culture explained them in its own way, within its own understanding. In antiquity, their occupants were regarded as gods, in medieval times, as magicians, in the 19th century, as science geniuses, and finally, in our own time as interplanetary travelers. 1460 BC, Upper Regenu, Lebanon, a star defeats the Nubians. The stella of Jebel Barkal, erected in honor of Thutmose III, describes a fantastic celestial event during a war. A star fell to their south position. It struck the Nubians. None could stand. The star positioned itself above them, as if they didn't exist, and then they fell upon their own blood. Now the star was behind them illuminating their faces with fire. No man amongst them could defend himself, none of them looked back. They had not their horses as these had fled into the mountain, frightened. 
such as the miracle that Amon did for me, his beloved son, in order to make the inhabitants of the foreign land see the power of my majesty. 1347 BC, El Amarna, Nile Valley. Pharaoh Amenophis IV had a unique experience that was to shape Egyptian history. According to inscriptions on the frontier stele, found on the circumference of El Amarna, Amenophis IV was strolling along the river, admiring the splendors of nature one summer morning. When he looked up and saw a shining disk descend from the sky, he heard the voice of the solar disk itself tell him that he was to build a new capital for Egypt and give it the name Akedaton, the horizon of the solar disk. During the time of Amenophis IV, Egypt's capital became the city of Akedaton. The ideographic symbol for the word horizon was a disk floating over a mountain range. Pharaoh took the Akhenaten name and also founded a new monotheistic religion based on the worship of the solar disk, thus assuring his immortality in our history books as the most powerful heretic of ancient Egypt. Although it refers here to the shape of the sun itself, it is interesting to find that the basic disk shape often mentioned in art and ancient manuscripts has been quoted as evidence of flying saucers by contemporary writers. That's just a few examples, but you can probably imagine the controversy if one overarching phenomenon is responsible for all close encounters throughout human history. Here are some examples fitting the era. 21 May 70 AD. Jerusalem. Flying chariots around the city. Flavius Josephus writes. On the 1 and 20th day of the month Artemisius, certain prodigious and incredible phenomenon appeared. I suppose the account of it would seem to be a fable, were it not related by those that saw it, and were not the events that followed it of so considerable a nature as to deserve such signals. For before sun setting, chariots and troops of soldiers in their armor were seen running about among the clouds and surrounding cities. Similar phenomenon happened in March 6, 1716. Northumberland, England. The historical register in London reports several saw a huge curtain of light across the sky. It started to move in a random fashion and dissolve into parts heading west and changing into large pillars of flame. In Oxford, locals saw cavalry fighting in the sky, and some near Liverpool reported seeing heavenly armies and smelled gunpowder. Astronomer of that time, Edmund Haley reported cones and cylinder-shaped objects during that event that reminded some of battlements and towers. He could not find an explanation. He wrote, It was a phenomenon that might well be taken to resemble the conflicts of men in a battle. There is a note in UK airport saying that in the late 19th century, UFO were reported as airships, complete with propellers cupolas. But in the cases of airships, it has no propeller sound and had rapid acceleration. There was, uh, starting in 1896 mm -hmm. and going into the spring of 1897, there was a, a remarkable wave of sightings of airships. Those were described as oval objects flying through the sky with lights on them. Uh, and of course, they, the people in those days could only compare it to dirigibles, mm -hmm. uh, could only compare them to airships. And uh, those objects were capable of doing all the things that UFOs do today, including taking off very quickly and making 90 degree turns and uh, landing and uh, occupants coming out of them. If the hypothesis that a technology behind UFO objects allowed to penetrate both physical environment of our world and a cognitive environment is correct, then it might explain a very close resemblance of UFO contactee experience with those described by shamans. But the other issue of, uh, of, of entities, that, that in the encounters with entities, anybody who's smoked DMT will know that, as I have, as, as you have, uh, that will know that you do encounter entities yeah. in, the DMT, in the DMT state, and they do communicate with us. And there's a lot of parallels with the ETs, or the aliens, as they're described in modern UFO abduction accounts. And of course, again, the skeptics say, oh, it's all just made up in your brain, but we don't know that. And we Rick is open that. to the possibility that we are dealing with 
areas of reality that are not normally accessible to our senses and that become yes. accessible to our senses by retuning the receiver wavelength of the brain, which is what <coughs> he suggests DMT does. And I think, I think that's very plausible. And at the very least, those who are interested in UFOs and aliens should be also investigating this line of inquiry. Can we, can we use changes in consciousness to understand the majestic complexity of the universe in which we live? And I think the answer is definitely yes. And many of Rick's volunteers, I paraphrase, but they came back with reports that the entities who'd encountered them said, we are so glad you've discovered this technology. Now we can communicate with you much more easily. If data in the official UK intelligence report is correct, and the phenomenon can appear in a way that makes sense to the observer, then perhaps that explains why perceptions of anomalous encounters change over time. And if the phenomenon can manipulate both physical and cognitive environments, then perhaps ufology has been too short-sighted. Modern UFO encounters do have cases that fit this hypothesis. August 4, 1950. Crew of the merchant ship Marcala are running a routine delivery in the North Atlantic. It's morning, and the skies are clear as they sail near the U.S. East Coast. Over the next hour, they'd experience something so bizarre, it causes any rational investigator to question the phenomenon's impact on human perception and even time. As three members of the crew are observing UFO passing by their ship at the same time, their reports have significant differences. The captain described observing an ovular, cylindrical-shaped flying object, 50 to 100 feet above the water, the likes of which he has never seen before. It had a shiny aluminium color, and sparkled in the sunlight. It was not flying smoothly, but had a rotary motion. The object made no noise, and as it passed the ship it appeared to pick up considerable speed. The chief mate described seeing an object of elliptic shape, looking like half an egg, cut lengthwise, traveling at a great rate of speed. He noted the tremendous speed, possibly faster than 500 miles per hour. It wobbled in the air, made no noise, and was a metallic white in color. The third mate described observing an elliptical flying object, more like a Japanese diamond box kite in shape. It made no noise. As it traveled through the air, it made a spinning or wobbly motion. After it disappeared in the horizon, he saw it reappear several seconds later, ascending at an even faster speed than when he first observed it. The intelligence officers noted that all three were quite evidently very much upset by the sighting. Shock Valley, a protege of J. Allen Hynek at Northwestern University, concluded by the late 1960s, the extraterrestrial hypothesis was too narrow. In 1975 he published The Invisible College, in which he examines the hypothesis of UFO as a control system. Quote, that they are not necessarily caused by extraterrestrial visitors, nor the result of misidentifications and hoaxes, on the part of deluded witnesses. If the hypothesis is true, then what the witnesses have seen, were manifestations of a process not unlike that of a thermostat in a house. Ballet proposes, that the UFO we see is, among other things, a device, which creates a distortion of the witnesses' reality that it does so for a purpose, which is to project images or fabricated scenes, designed to change our belief systems, and that the technology we observe, is only the incidental support, for a worldwide enterprise of subliminal seduction. Ballet later clarifies, when I speak of a control system, I do not want my words to be misunderstood. I do not mean that some higher order of beings, has locked us inside the constraints of a space-bound jail, closely monitored by psychic entities we might call angels or demons. I do not propose to redefine God. What I do mean, is that mythology rules at a level of our social reality over which normal political and intellectual action has no real power. Civilizations like Mohenjo-Daro, in the river Hindus area, like Egypt, like Maya, Incas, like Babylonian culture, collapsed and disappeared from the surface of Earth. The moment they lost religion, as simple as that, they disintegrated. Nobody remembers about them anymore. Well, distantly. The ideas are moving society and keeping mankind 
as, as, as society of human beings. The facts, the truth, the exact knowledge may not. All the sophisticated technology and computers will not prevent society from disintegrating and eventually dying out. But millions sacrifice their life, freedom, comfort, everything for things like God, like Jesus Christ. It's an honor. There is a good historical example for this. To the educated disciples of Aristotle and Plato, many religious writings, such as the Apocalypse of St. John, must have looked like laughable delusions, unworthy of scholarly examination. None of these brilliant minds speculated for a second that such lunacy, spreading among their ignorant slaves, might eventually destroy the Greek scientific establishment, and then our civilization will fall into a thousand-year darkness. The phenomenon behaves like a conditioning process. The logic of conditioning uses absurdity and confusion to achieve its goal while hiding its mechanism. There is a similar structure in the UFO stories. Such an element of absurdity is a special sign of messages from UFOs. Perhaps such an absurdity is part of the method known as the gentle art of reframing, discovered by Dr. Milton Erickson. Erickson described it as the confusion technique. As a result of confusion, unalleviated by any further information, that would have reorganized the pieces of the puzzle into an understandable new frame of reference. As Erickson points out, the need to get out of the confusion by finding this new frame makes the subject particularly ready and eager to hold on firmly to the next piece of concrete information that he is given. The confusion, setting the stage for reframing, thus becomes an important step in the process of effecting second-order change, and, of showing the fly the way, out of the fly bottle. Remember Tertullian's paradox, credo quia absurdum est, it literally means, I believe because it is absurd. What if we deal with some other, unknown, and intangible form of life, on Earth? When you talk about this topic, the phenomenon, people say, well, it's either from Earth or it's from outer space. It's extraterrestrial. But in reality, that's not necessarily so. There's a whole bunch of other potentials and options that this could be. This is something we have been dealing with for, for a long time. And, and like a lot of things, imagine the first person who decided to get on a boat and sail over the horizon, right? And there's discussion of sea monsters and krakens that will devour you and destroy your boat. And yet, we did it anyways. We did sail and, and, and we, we explored the world. And it turns out, you know, 500 years later, yeah, there really are sea monsters, except, except for we call them the great squid of the Pacific and we call them great white sharks and whales. Uh, now they're just part of nature. They have a scientific name. But, you know, those sea monsters still exist. They're there. Um, we just learned to understand them. And maybe this is the same thing. Maybe this is just yet another uh, uh, another expedition over the horizon in which we're going to realize what we, we thought were, were, were monsters or really just neighbors. Neighbors from a whole other biosphere. Something similar to the old idea of a parallel world. Except that this is in parallel, but coexistent separate creations, inhabiting the same matrix, but using it in totally different ways, wrapped around each other like a geometric design in an Escher print, like a Chinese puzzle ball, and only coming into contact in a very rare and limited fashion. That's how Vo Vodsky, mathematician at Princeton, put it, quote, at first, about a very general idea that was difficult for me to accept, but based on all the experience that I have been through over the past five years, I could not think of anything else. There are non-human intelligences around us. By the word intelligence here, I mean an information system that has memory, motivations, the ability to model the external world, and to plan. They are not alien, but native to Earth and, most likely, evolutionarily older than humans. These minds actively and sometimes negatively affect people's lives. The non-human intelligences, who seem to be some kind of distant relatives of the other races of Earth. 
a number of very interesting questions arise, if we do not discount the fact that this is still some kind of interstellar race. Do these objects operate only on Earth, or do they periodically leave our planet, because these may be reconnaissance probes of an alien civilization? Something that we ourselves send outside of our solar system. But if they have been here for a much longer period than 70 years apparently, then what is the real purpose of such monitoring? For what purpose does an interstellar race need to be near an alien star system, for so long without revealing its presence? For the purpose of observation and study. But to understand us, it takes much less time than a whole decade, especially for an alien super race capable of interstellar flights. Terence McKenna once remarked that, quote, we are part of a symbiotic relationship with something which disguises itself as an extraterrestrial invasion, so as not to alarm us. It's interesting, what could be scarier than the invasion of aliens, that you need to disguise yourself as them? Of course, if another version is true, that these objects may be something else, that does not belong to alien civilizations, then everything becomes even more suspicious. After all, if alien creatures look at least something possible from a scientific point of view, then something else that can disguise itself as them, is really frightening. Since the goals of an absolutely unknown intelligence, remain a complete mystery. A mystery, that still turns out to be possible to solve though, if instead of words, you pay attention to the actions of those gods from flying machines. If you examine the history of their activity, that made it to us in the form of the most ancient legends and stories. There is nothing joyful about this, because the pictures that are being restored about our past, based on ancient legends and stories, are generally not very pleasant for humanity. Humanity was created as slaves of the gods. Man himself was created to work for the gods and he had absolutely no rights. All mankind is descended from slaves. Think for a moment about how this will affect psychologically the minds of people, even in our society today. This is the first moment. The second moment. If we admit that most of the history of mankind was influenced from the outside, when we were manipulated, when we were guided, the question arises. So is it just stopped? Why couldn't this manipulation, but in a different form, continue now? And this is also unpleasant. This is already the beginning of persecution mania and so on. That is, in fact, a revision in the perception of ancient history would have major consequences for the psychology of the masses. Then maybe such a strange form of UFO's contact will not seem strange if we will think about a self-sustaining control system that should function for thousands of years without additional intervention. Subversion is the term usually is, ex is explained as a part of activity to destroy things like uh, religion, government, system. The highest art of warfare is not to fight at all, but to subvert until such time that the perception of reality of your enemy is screwed up to such an extent that he does not perceive you as an enemy and that your system, your civilization and your ambitions look to your enemy as an alternative, if not desirable, then at least visible. That's the ultimate purpose, the final stage of subversion, after which you can simply take your enemy without a single shot being fired, if the subversion is successful. This is basically what subversion is. Many people around us today are preparing to greet UFO with delight. Even if that means falling under the control of forces they do not understand. These people are the UFO contactees and the believers in celestial visitation, the followers of the saucer prophets. They can pave the way for dramatic changes. Before we reject these views as examples of harmless lunacy, we should observe that people once had the same view of the Church of Scientology, or also used to completely reject the beliefs of the Mormon Church, whose founder would today be regarded as a contactee. 
but how many religious movements started in the same way. In other words, not to be a victim of subversion. Don't try to be a person who in Zudo is trying to smash your enemy and being caught by your hand. Don't strike like that. Strike with the power of your spirit and moral superiority. If you don't have that power, it's high time to develop it. And that's the only answer.